uh, don't use your webcam and uh, don't use your uh, real name. In fact, you can even log out and log in again with a, a fake uh, a fake name if you wish to. So people continue to join. Let's, uh, let's get started. Welcome to Epilepsy Eye Connect at Home. I'm uh, Dr. Robert Fisher. I head the Epilepsy Center at Stanford. Uh, I was uh, previously the editor of the uh, epilepsy.com and I'm, I'm interested in, in public education. Um, obviously, uh, people with epilepsy uh, often desire information, but it isn't always easy to drive to uh, meetings. So this is uh, a webinar that uh, is endeavoring to provide information on different subjects. Uh, we've been running it the first Saturday of, uh, I'm sorry, the second Saturday of every month at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, that's California time, which would be 2 o'clock Eastern time. Um, the notion behind it is not just to be a lecture, but to present about 15 minutes of material in the beginning and then um, have a Q&A and I hope there will be interaction among the audience members and not just uh, questions from me. So here's how the rules go. You would type uh, into your browser that um, address that I uh, indicated uh, before, uh, gotomeeting.com front slash join front slash 42608-1109. Uh, that is good only for this session. Or click on the link that was sent to you by email from the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California. Um, phone in, and I won't read the phone in. Um, well, I will because some of you might, might be online and soundless. You can call at 1-408-650-3123. Again, that's 1-408-650-3123, access code 426-081-109, access code 426-081-109. And that will, uh, that will get you audio. You won't see the slides um, or you won't see my webcam. The latter is no great loss. The slides are. So uh, your microphones will be on mute during the introductory talk. Um, during the talk, please type questions or comments into your chat box. Uh, you won't have one if you're on the phone, but if you're online in the computer, you should see a, a typing box where you can type uh, chats. Uh, after the uh, talk, uh, the uh, hostess, who's by my side, uh, Robin Owen, will organize the questions and comments. And then we'll call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone or your phone uh, to talk. Uh, I would hope the audience would share thoughts and experiences uh, with each other. After all, you all are the experts on uh, this condition, not the doctors. Uh, we are recording the session for posting on YouTube and elsewhere. So if you wish to be anonymous, don't use the video and log in with a, uh, a fake name. Um, please note that uh, just like any medical show on the radio or TV, uh, this is an educational program, and um, uh, although you may use elements of your story or your history to pose a question, uh, I will do my very best to refrain from uh, giving medical advice online. So this is not a therapeutic session. This is an educational session. So well, let's begin. The subject uh, today is thinking and memory problems. Um, as a uh, practicing clinic physician, the main issues that people uh, come into my clinic uh, indicating troubles with uh, are fatigue, dizziness, blurry vision, unsteadiness, and memory problems. These things as side effects of seizure medications, but also uh, sometimes from other causes besides the medication. And memory problems are very prominent. As a matter of fact, I think in California, except possibly for issues about driving, uh, memory problems are the most common problems that are raised in clinic visits. The International Bureau for Epilepsy, which is the parent organization of the American Epilepsy Society, a group of professionals doing research on and caring for people with epilepsy, have done uh, surveys of cognitive function, which means thinking function, 
in Europeans. And among 425 Europeans uh, surveyed, 44% uh, of them had difficulty learning, 45% of them had slow thinking, 59% said they were sleepy or tired, and 63% said that medication side effects prevented them from achieving their goals. That's a pretty substantial uh, number of people who believe that they are cognitively impaired. What are the factors then that affect memory in people with epilepsy? There's a, a troika that overlaps. One of them uh, are the ongoing seizures themselves. Um, many people find that for quite a while after a seizure, their memory is really not very good. This is part of what we call the post-ictal state or the post-seizure state. And uh, of course, people have uh, often a complete blank of memory during the time they're having seizures. Not everybody knows when seizure activity is going on in the brain. So sometimes there can be what we call subclinical seizures that may be affecting the memory and the person is not even aware that they're having seizures. The second big uh, factor in the three circles uh, are medication side effects. And I will come back to that in more detail in a few minutes. And the third one, which is a little more subtle to understand, is that something caused the epilepsy. Half of the time we can't figure out what that something is, but it's some subtle form of brain injury, maybe not subtle, or uh, a genetic predisposition that caused the epilepsy. And that injury may also have in itself affected the memory. So you get this triple whammy, seizures, medication side effects, and the underlying injury to the brain, all of which can impair thinking and memory. So these are the cognitive abilities, and again, cognitive means thinking, that are most likely to be affected by anti-epileptic drugs. You see the man in the upper right trying to figure out where to put that black peg. One is processing speed, uh, which people with epilepsy would perceive as just being slowed down and not reacting as quickly to things. Second is complex or sustained attention, when you need to focus. Third is dual processing. Think of someone who's got a phone on each ear in a sales job, two people talking to them at once. They've got to think of more than one thing. It's very hard to do when you're on some of the anti-epileptic medications. You can only concentrate on one thing at a time. Then there's verbal learning. That's remembering the name of the person who just came up and shook your hand. Verbal fluency, coming up with the words. And then mood. Mood is a big issue as well. There are different types of, different types of memory. Um, scientists uh, divide them up by uh, category of memory and duration of the memory. Um, in terms of category or type of the memory, there's procedural memory and declarative memory. Procedural is the sort of thing that really you tend not to forget, like how to ride a bike, how to use a fork, unless there's major, major brain injury. And I must say that in the uh, movies and TV shows and novels, uh, amnesia is often misrepresented where people lose memories that they would never lose and still be able to function. However, declarative memory uh, is often affected. Uh, these are people's names, these are learning of lists, that kind of thing. The other category of memory division is duration, short, medium, and long term. Short term memory would be the sort of thing that would have you remembering a phone number, maybe a 10 digit phone number with an area code for five seconds long enough to dial. Medium would be the name of a person introduced to you about 10 minutes ago. And a long term might be where you went to elementary school or who your second grade teacher was. So I'd like you to take a moment and think about which kinds of these sorts of memory problems, procedural, declarative, short, medium, or long term, give you problems. What are the sorts of things that you have trouble remembering or thinking about? And feel free to type a comment into the chat box about what sort of memory problems you have. We'll come back to it later in the questions and the discussion uh, sessions. So now we come to the, to the drugs, to the medications that we use for people with epilepsy. 
And here we have a question. Which medicines have caused you the most memory problems? Before I go on to tell you the ones that usually cause the most memory problems, let me emphasize that there's no right or wrong answer here because people react differently to the different medicines. So some people may have no problem on one, one medicine. Another person may feel that their memory is wiped out uh, by the medicine. These are the drugs uh, typically that are best, medium, and worst uh, for memory. Now when I say this, uh, please understand the good news that memory problems from these medications are never permanent. It's only an issue of when the drug is circulating in your blood and your brain that they're causing the problem because they're designed to make your brain cells not fire as quickly. And that's good during a seizure where the cells need to fire quickly, but it's not good when you're trying to come up with a name that goes with the face of that person that you know you know, but you can't think of the name. Those that we tend to think of as being best for memory, not that any of them make memory better, but at least less deleterious to working memory, are levetiracetam, which is Keppra, Lamotrigine, which is Lamictal, Gabapentin, which is Neurontin, and Lacosamide, which is Vimpat. And then if we skip over to the red box to the right, those that are worst for memory in general are phenobarbital, topiramate, which is topamax, zonisamide, which is zonogram, clonazepam, clonazepam, which is clonopin, chlorazepate, which is transine, diazepam, which is valium, and lorazepam, which is ativan. Correct. I'm having trouble correcting a spelling error sideways, so I'll ignore it. So if you are on any of these memories in red, uh, any, in, I'm sorry, if you are on any of these medicines in red and having memory problems, I'm not advising you to stop. Do not stop your seizure medicine on the basis of this program. But um, perhaps you should discuss with your, with your medical care team whether an adjustment in those medicines might help the memory. There uh, are individual variations, and there are some drugs, especially the new ones, which are not really tested very well in memory yet, so we're not sure what effect they have in memory. Then you have drugs that sometimes affect memory, sometimes don't in different people. Phenytoin, which is dilantin, carbamazepine, which is tegretol, oxcarbazepine, which is trileptal, and valproate or valproic acid, which is Depakote. Mood makes an enormous difference in memory. Depressed people think they're doing much worse than they are on tests of thinking and memory. So let's talk, uh, talk about the brain structures that are responsible for, for memory functions. Um, of course, we have the cerebral cortex. That's the mantle of cells on the outside of the brain with all the infolding. This is what makes us who we are, the thinking most advanced part of the brain. There's the thalamus, which is the gateway to the cortex. Um, and then there's the hippocampus, which is the most seizure-prone structure in the brain. It is uh, deep in the temporal lobe. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And uh, in cross-section, it has the structure that looks a bit like a seahorse. Memories are not stored in the hippocampus, but you need a working hippocampus to get items into memory and out of memory. So you can think of it as being the uh, administrative assistant that files memories into the rest of the brain and then retrieves them when they're necessary. Here is an MRI of a brain uh, with a damaged hippocampus in a person with epilepsy. It's called mesial temporal sclerosis or sometimes hippocampal sclerosis. And um, here on the right side, MRI inverts left and right, you see a normal hippocampus in cross-section. And here I've blown it up at the bigger size and outlined it in red. Here on the other side, it's brighter and flatter. Here you see circled here how much smaller that red circle is on the left and the right. This hippocampus is 
damaged, it's scarred. Left side of the brain in right-handers is responsible for speech. The right side of the brain is typically responsible for memory, maps, pictures, structural relations. So a person with a scarred hippocampus on the left like this would be expected to have quite a bit of trouble with word and name uh, memory, and, and many people do. When we see this on an MRI, uh, it suggests to us that the seizures are coming from the left side of the, of the brain. Now, do seizures harm memory? This is a question that has been debated for many, many decades. All epilepsy doctors agree that the condition of status epilepticus, which is a seizure that goes on for a long time without stopping, for example, greater than 30 minutes, can do harm to the brain and can scar the brain, leading to further seizures and thinking and memory problems. What is less clear and more controversial is whether ordinary seizures harm the brain. There's no definite answer to this and certainly um, I would encourage you not to worry that every seizure that you have is killing brain cells. I don't think that is the case. But many of us, including me, do believe that if there are frequent seizures over many years that a person's memory becomes worse because the hippocampus on one side or both sides, depending upon where the seizures are happening, may experience some deterioration and therefore the memory uh, may decline slowly over time. We're not talking Alzheimer's, but we are talking about word finding problems or sometimes face map memory problems if it's on the non-dominant side of the brain. One time, at least one time to medical science's knowledge, both hippocampi were intentionally removed to treat seizures that were coming from both sides. The reason this was done is because it was early in the history of seizure surgery in the 1950s and it was not known that there would be a devastating side effect of removing both hippocampi. This patient H.M. had surgery in 1953 and never formed a new memory after that time. He remembered everything that happened before, everything that you should remember, where he went to school, who his parents were, where he was born, even the evaluation for surgery. But with no hippocampus on either side, when you walked into his room afterwards, introduced yourself, he would say hello, he'd say your name, you'd walk out, you'd walk back in five minutes later, he would have no memory of ever having met you before. He actually spent the rest of his life as a psychological test subject. So, of course, since 1953, no one has ever taken out both hippocampi in epilepsy surgery. But there are people who have both sides, meaning bilateral damage to both hippocampi, and they can have severe memory problems. People whose seizures come from both sides of the temporal lobe have more memory problems for this reason than people who have seizures only on one side. So what are the uh, neuropsychological effects of taking out the inner anterior portion of a temporal lobe? Well, on the right side, as I said, uh, the non-dominant side, as we call it, in right-handers, left-handers can be either dominant on the left or the right. The, the problems tend to be with visual, spatial, or face memories. And on the left side, uh, problems with word and number memories. So um, take a moment then to jot into the chat box what kinds of things you most often uh, forget and uh, we can discuss those later. Now um, let me see if we are getting chat questions. I think we, I think we are. So those are, uh, those are coming in. Uh, and do keep the questions coming in. We'll come back to them in a moment. We're getting to the end of the, of the talk part of this. So the predictors of having more of a problem after having uh, epilepsy surgery on the temporal lobe, which is the most common place we, we operate for epilepsy, um, 
more so if we're on the language dominant side, usually the left side is the language dominant side. Uh, more problems if surgery is uh, done at an older age or if the seizures came on at an older age. There's more to lose if people have a very sharp memory at the start. There's more to lose if the hippocampus does not show that type of atrophy or scarring, the hippocampal sclerosis that I showed in an earlier picture. Conversely, if it does show that type of scarring, then generally the memory is not very much worse off when taking it out because it's already pretty damaged and non-functional. Plus the seizures emerging from that damaged hippocampus can spread into the normal brain and affect the function of the normal brain. And then there's greater cognitive decline if the surgery doesn't work and the seizure control remains poor postoperatively. However, if the seizure surgery does work and it stops the seizures, that helps the memory. And then after a year or two, when you can cut down the anti-epileptic drug, that helps the memory as well. So sometimes memory gets worse for a few months after seizure surgery, but uh, then after the healing and recovery time, and especially with medication reduction, the memory may get better or stop declining. These days, uh, we're doing uh, many of our temporal lobectomies with a laser fiber heating up at the tip through a rod placed from the back of the head into the hippocampus. This area that shows the white surrounding is a uh, laser burned region of hippocampus. And uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a better way of doing surgery in cases where it can be applied because um, you don't have to open the skull except a very small hole in the back. You don't have to go through healthy brain to get to the inner hippocampus and the patients can typically go home uh, the next day and can feel pretty, pretty well. But it is still brain surgery and you still are losing the hippocampus when you do it. Medications have a lot of memory side effects, some more than others, but neurostimulation uh, therapies do not have memory side effects. And by that I mean the vagus nerve stimulator, uh, the uh, thalamic uh, Sante stimulation of the anterior nucleus of thalamus for epilepsy, deep brain stimulator, which is used around the world but not yet in the United States, or the responsive neurostimulator uh, by the company Neuropace that is available in the U.S. Uh, these neurostimulation therapies do not have a deleterious effect on memory. It's worth uh, mentioning um, cognitive effects on the fetus if a woman is taking certain anti-epileptic medications during pregnancy. Uh, Depakote, valproic acid, and also phenobarbital, although it's not listed on this slide, are known to have a negative effect on the cognitive function of uh, children born to mothers who are taking those medicines during pregnancy when the child is tested at three or five years of age. So I've set out the problem uh, in a little bit of detail. What can you do about it? What can you do about a bad memory? This is a picture from the movie Memento where he kept forgetting things so he would tattoo on his skin um, notes that he needed to uh, solve his, uh, his uh, uh, problem. So uh, right into your chat box. Uh, you all are the experts on what to do about a bad memory. What have you tried? How has it worked or not worked for you? Do these things help? They've been suggested. Memory medicines, Dinepazil, which is Aricept, and Lamantine, which is Nemenda. Uh, these are medicines that are used in Alzheimer's. A bad memory from epilepsy is not Alzheimer's. It does not progress to Alzheimer's. But some people feel that the memories, uh, medicines that help Alzheimer's uh, can help memory problems in people with epilepsy. It's not so clear that that's the case, but have you tried it and have they helped you? Uh, brain exercises such as uh, crossword puzzles, uh, perhaps the uh, the, the um, the uh, system Lumosity, which is um, 
intentionally challenging to uh, thinking exercises, um, reading and keeping mentally active. Physical exercise is the only treatment that's been proven to prevent or forestall Alzheimer's and it might be useful as well for memory problems with epilepsy. I don't really know. Write down strategies and then mnemonic tricks like stage magic uh, tricks to help with memories. Which of these things have you tried? Uh, do they help? So what can you do about a bad memory? Well, one thing is you can control the seizures. You can minimize your seizure medicines. You can avoid the medicines that are particularly known for impairing memory, or even better, that impair memory in your particular case. You can keep mentally and physically active. You can treat depression if present, because depression amplifies cognitive problems. You can develop a note-taking strategy of writing things down or maybe dictating into your smartphone. And you could consider getting a stage magic book and trying mnemonic tricks with associations and walking through a room and visualizing. Uh, and some of you may have may have answers of your of your own. So that is uh, that's the end of, of my uh, part of the presentation. And let's now uh, go to some questions and uh, comments. Uh, Robin, what uh, question would you like me to call on? Um, well, a lot of people are talking about um, music as something that has been helpful um, helpful to them in terms of, uh, of uh, mitigating the memory problems or making things more memorable. So, uh, give me a give me a name, and we can open a mic for. Uh, um, let me see here. Angie. Angie, uh, can you uh, can you open uh, open your microphone and and uh, comment on music so we know what uh, what you're thinking? Are you there, Angie? And Krista. M. And Krista M is another. If you can open your your mic or your phone. And Gina also. And Gina. Let's make sure we don't have everyone muted. You do. I can't Hello. get on the okay, now, I, now we can hear. So, uh, Gina um, or Krista, anyone who is talking about music, please uh, make a comment. You may have to individually un unmute your microphone at your end. We've globally unmuted people. I can't get on the web. I'm just listening. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I've, I've had a lot of experience. I was born with epilepsy due to a disaster of birth. And Please speak up a little. Talk a little. I was born with epilepsy um, due to a disaster of birth. I lost too much oxygen. And... I had it all my life. It got worse because of my hormone issue. And then I started going into status. And my whole life I've had memory problems. I've had problems with my teachers battling with them. And in fact, it just took me 20 years to get my BA. I accomplished it last year. Congratulations. Because of my teacher. Thank you. It took a lot of hard work and battling with my teachers because I had awesome ones, but then I had ones that just tried to do everything they could to get me to give up. But I didn't let it happen. And with my memory problems, I've always written things down, repeated things in my brain all day long to keep my brain focusing. Because I've realized when I was in college, if I just let myself go during summer break, I couldn't remember anything for my last semester and I'd fail my next class. So I had to keep my mind going all summer. 
and it wasn't easy, and it stressed me out, and a lot of stress but on the seizures. Um, I, after I had the vagus nerve stimulator implanted in me, I had it in, in 1995, I was on the study, I stopped going into status. Oh, you and stopped going into status? I stopped going into status. It mellowed my seizures out, but it was, I was still severe, but I was still feeling so much better. I mean, when I woke up from my sur surgery, I even felt like a better person. Um, it was amazing. That's and great. That was at U that was at UCLA in 1995, and then my dad took me to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they said I'm lucky to be alive. Um, if Dr. David Cole at USC doesn't get you seizure free, you'll never go seizure free. Well, he did. I went seizure free March 1st, 2000 was my very last seizure until 2008. I had a okay. hormone shot. I had a hormone shot, and wham, everything went out of control. I mean, out of control. I my seizures. I couldn't. Some of the seizures are hormonally sensitive. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it is it Gina? I'm, no, my I'm not, name is Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. So Jennifer, um, your your story is is somewhat um, inspiring to me and perhaps to others. You you struggled against a bad memory uh, from from birth from from seizures that came yeah, from birth, but you still you got your degree. And I think you also indicated that when you had a stimulator put in that kept you from going into status epilepticus, very prolonged seizures, your memory improved yeah. as well. So th thank you for that. Yeah. Let's give some other people a, a chance to talk and comment um, on uh, what experience they've had with thinking and memory. Um, thank you. Mrs. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, S. S. Sawicki, uh, are you available uh, on the microphone to talk about uh, music and music therapy? If not, we'll read the uh, we'll read the comment. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. What's your experience uh, been? With music, first of all, I am in a choir, and I'm using that as brain um, stimulation. I, I will say. Um, I guess it helps my memory. No, <laughs> it helps my um, just mental attitude. But I'm, I'm on Onfi, which is a benzodiazepine. Yes. Uh, I'm really afraid of it. I've been under control for three years. Um, but I've been trying the ketose, uh, ketogenic diet, which is horrible. And um, I'm going to try something else. I'm just afraid to go off since I've got something that's working. So regarding music, it's just a mood elevator. Um, it's me in any other way. I see. Well, anything that anything that uh, lightens depression is highly likely to help memory and thinking because people are in such a brain fog when they have uh, when they have low mood. Um, and in fact, it may even help seizure control when depression is uh, treated. Uh, it's a it's a subject for another uh, session. The last session we did was on psychiatric issues and epilepsy, and uh, we'll possibly repeat that uh, session at some point. Other uh, other questions or comments, Robin? Um, Sarah Wright, um, Wright Temple, had memory problems before because of seizures, and now she's actually noticed. Sarah, uh, are you uh, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm right here. Well, and I'm sorry. Brief, briefly tell your story, not at too much uh, length, but just the uh, outline. I had a temporal lobectomy last year. Um, I was seizure free, or I had seizures pretty much my entire life and uh, had a temporal lobectomy on the right side last year. I've been seizure-free for one year now for the first time in my life. Um, but I noticed that after they took out the temporal lobe, two-thirds of the right temporal lobe, there's a disconnect. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if that's normal. First, uh, let me ask, are you right-handed? I am. I, I have cerebral palsy. I'm. I have left hemiparesis on the left side. I see. So um, the uh, speech almost certainly would be on the left side of your brain. Um, yeah. 
And uh, what kind of memory problems did you have afterwards? What sorts of things would you forget? Um, the best way I can describe it is everything is just gone. After maybe two or three days, it feels like I've gone into a black fog. Um, like it never happened. And so, so, for example, if you saw a movie a week ago, you would not remember it now? That kind of thing? Yeah, it's like, in theory, I knew, knew that I went and did something, but somebody would have to tell me that I went and did it. And, I mean, you mentioned that zanisamide is one of the worst medications to be on and Keppra is one of the best. Well, I'm taking both. <laughs> yeah. So... Well, um, I will refrain from giving medical advice, but I'll repeat that if anybody has a bad memory and is on a medicine that might make that memory worse, that it yeah. be discussed with, with physicians. I have seen remarkable improvements in memory from people who've gotten off uh, Topamax or Zonogram, Topiramate uh, and, and, and Zonisamide, both of which, by the way, are very excellent seizure medications, but in some people, maybe one out of three, they have that significant memory side effect. So, well, that would be my big hope for you, is that a lot of your memory fog is due to medication, because that's very treatable. Otherwise, there's a question of whether your left hippocampus, the good one that's left behind, is functioning at 100% to take up the slack when the right is gone. It's not usual for people to have uh, memory problems a year after temporal lobectomy, at least worse memory problems. So something something happened, and I won't I won't attempt over the internet to to figure what it is. But with luck, some of it's due to the zonisamide. So good luck. Talk to the doctor about that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Who else? Can I ask one question? Sure. Um, I've been having problems with my vagus nerve stimulator. We're trying to figure it out because of pain. And we we're too scared to take it out of me. And if it's on too strong, even just like a 1.2 or something, I'm getting pains in my neck and it causes pains in my shoulders down my arm. But the doctors don't want to confirm that. But I've had that experience of when it's gone on too high then we lowered it like, wham, oh my God, pain's gone. Oh. Yeah, so uh, it's a little off subject. I'll answer, but I'll answer briefly. Uh, we do a whole session actually on the vagus nerve and other stimulators too. I'll repeat it someday. The uh, vagus nerve uh, stimulator in the chest should not hurt around the place uh, the stimulator is, is uh, sitting. When it does, it's usually a, uh, a leak of the stimulating current into the surrounding tissue, uh, often because maybe some scar cells have grown in uh, to the device and made a little electrical bridge that can leak. Uh, the answer to that is uh, turning down the stimulating current uh, in order to uh, make it non-painful, or potentially, you don't have to take it out, but sometimes um, a, a surgeon will just make a cut there in the chest, we'll pull the uh, connecting lead out, we'll scrape it clean, uh, and we'll put it back into the slot, and now it's a good seal that doesn't leak anymore, and uh, that's pretty pretty minor surgery. Uh, but I would it's not recommend that you continue with it hurting. So let's, let's, move, let's move back to the memory uh, issues as the focus today. Robin, what do you, uh, what do you have? Well, Carol Friedman here was talking about moving um, back and forth between the drugs that I landed and um, Dilantin. Phenytoin is Dilantin. Phenytoin and, um, brand name versus generic there. Okay, and she had felt like the jelly had caused um, varying effects on her memory. Okay. Um, uh, but then to join you there. Yes. Carol, are you there? So phenytoin uh, or dilantin is uh, one of the drugs that's uh, usually in the medium category of 
of affecting memory uh, definitely can do it in some people. And if specifically a difference is noted between uh, brand name Dilantin and generic phenytoin, then I think what's happening is a variation in the blood level of the drug. The, the main problem with generics is that they may not be as bioavailable in the same way as the brand name. So you may end up, if you switch to a generic, getting either more drug or less drug in your system. If you get less drug, you may have a seizure. If you get more drug, you may have side effects, such as worse memory problems. So this is an issue uh, for, the, for your medical team uh, to check what the levels of uh, the drugs are to make sure that they're in the range that they're supposed to be, where they can be most beneficial against the seizures without causing side effects. Who next, Robin? Well, um, a few people are asking if they might have a, a way of seeing um, main slides again. Um, and people who had trouble with access in the beginning, so um, can you make these visible or let them know where the, they can access them? Yes. Um, the For those of you who didn't didn't hear that, some of you are, are wanting to uh, see the main slides again. Um, we're recording this uh, session. We will um, post the recording uh, and the slides on the website of the uh, Epilepsy Foundation of uh, Northern uh, California um, and uh, probably on YouTube and maybe also on epilepsy.com. Uh, so you'll have a great opportunity to look at them again. We also will transcribe the uh, the discussion and the, the lecture part that I gave, uh, although we will uh, anonymize the, the names. Have any of you um, tried anything for helping memory that's worked? Or have you tried things that haven't worked? Do you have any advice for your colleagues on this, uh, on this call uh, for what might be helpful? We can't do a brain transplant or even a hippocampus transplant yet for memory. So what do you do when you have a bad memory? I'm sorry, I see uh, Patricia. Can we unmute Patricia? It looks like she's interested in talking. We're looking to unmute you, Patricia. We don't, we're not hearing you yet. Are you unmuted on your end? Uh, you're not coming through, Patricia. Well, we can read your, we can find and read your uh, comment if you have one. I, we do see your video, Patricia. We just don't have sound. All right. So what, what I'm going to do now, I'm sorry, Patricia, we can't hear you. Apologies. I don't know why you're not coming through. Um, I'm going to uh, scan through some of the other chat comments and uh, share some of them. And then we'll, uh, we'll see if people want to want to talk. There's a question, is there always a problem with a hippocampus that affects memory? In other words, can you have memory issues but a healthy hippocampus? Yes, of course. I didn't mean to imply that the hippocampus was the only structure in the brain responsible for memory. It's, it's really just the gateway uh, to memory, but uh, there are many other places uh, in the brain that can cause memory problems. Uh, problems with the cortex, which is the main thinking part of the brain, problems with the thalamus, which is a deep structure, problems with the posterior part of the hypothalamus or, or the brain stem. Uh, and sometimes you're going to have problems with memory and you're not going to be able to identify uh, anything that's wrong structurally with any part of brain. So here um, Krista's indicated that her main problems are with declarative memory in the short and the medium term. And that is, in fact, what most people with epilepsy have problems with. Most people with epilepsy 
and on anti-epilepsy medicines. I remember perfectly well where they went to elementary school, but they do have trouble um, with what you might consider absent-mindedness, told something and then that is uh, forgotten. Declarative, Dr. short. Yeah. We hear. This is Patricia. Patricia, we hear you now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I met you in at the Vacaville um, meeting. I was on the board with you. Yes. I, I I was walking through my living room five weeks ago, and I fell. And I've had. I can I barely had, hear you. Speak up. Okay. I fell. I fell um, in my living room, and I hit my head. Oh. And I've had a concussion for about five weeks. Goodness. Have, having still having trouble doing my. I can't do my work at at the restaurant. I can't do the dining room. I get confused. I'm concerned about how long this takes, and um, um, I'm I'm around people and I get confused. And I've never been that way before. Yes. From the so um, I can't say in your in your case again. Um, I would have to I'd have to be there with you and examine you, but um, concussions uh, take much longer to recover from than a lot of people um, consider. It can take months to recover from a concussion. Um, the good news is if there's no explicit brain damage, if you just kind of scramble things a bit, um, but you you, ha you haven't had a blood clot in the brain, you haven't had a equivalent of a stroke for the brain then there's a good possibility that, that you will get back completely to what you were like before. That's not a promise. I'm just saying that most people with a concussion do. But um, during the, uh, the time people are recovering from concussions, it's very hard to form memories. It's very hard to handle things that are complicated or parallel processing coming in at once. Um, there's um, often a lot of uh, dizziness and fogginess, and there's also a considerable element of depression, which I think is biological in some cases, uh, having to do with neurotransmitters in the in the brain. So I'm sorry you uh, you hit your head, but uh, the fact that you're still having problems doesn't mean that it's going to be forever. It can take it can take months. I've even known someone who took two years to recover from a concussion. That's why there's so much discussion on the political scene about uh, football and boxing and such yeah. things. Yeah. All right, continuing to... Patricia, we're going to go on with some other memory so, questions. Another question that's come up, I guess, from a number of different people is that um, do they need to consider, for instance, um, if they have issues with ADHD or um, thyroid medications or medications basically from other um, conditions, do they, do they need to consider this as part of the memory issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, if you've got something else going on, it's going to add to the memory problems of epilepsy. If, for example, you have low thyroid, hypothyroidism, that's going to give you memory problems. If you have poorly functioning kidneys or poorly functioning liver or substance abuse or withdrawal problems, uh, that's going to give you memory problems. If you have sleep apnea or for any other reason you don't get a good night's sleep, you'll have memory problems from that and it will just add to the memory problems of the epilepsy. So, of course, always try to treat the other memory conditions um, if you can and the underlying cause of memory problems. Now, um, ADHD, which is Attention uh, Deficit Disorder with Hyperactivity Disorder, um, is another comorbidity, fellow traveler, of epilepsy in a lot of people, along with depression and memory problems and anxiety. And um, ADHD manifests itself as an inability to function, an inability to focus on one subject for a long period of time. And that being the case, um, you bounce the subject to subject and you really don't concentrate enough to remember things well. So that too has, uh, has treatments. There are um, psychotherapeutic uh, ways of training yourself to be better for that and there are medications that can safely be used uh, to treat ADHD. 
I put that in the box of another condition that can add to the problem. Fix it if you can. Other questions? A lot of people are uh, the type of memory problems they have is being declarative and medium term. Uh, and uh, again, I agree, that is normally what people with epilepsy uh, do mention. Um, Therese has indicated that uh, Topamax, Topiramate, is a medicine that is uh, particularly troublesome for the memory. And again, that has been common uh, experience. Topiramate, uh, zonisamide, phenobarbital, and sometimes the whole category of benzodiazepines are pretty tough on memory. Here's a question, what about uh, Aptium? Uh, Aptium is a eslacarbazepine. It's a Tegretol, a carbamazepine-like uh, medication. And it's too new, really, to, to have uh, full scientific studies about its role in memory. So we tend to, at the moment, since it's similar to carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, which is trileptol, suspect that it will be medium on memory because its sister drugs are medium on memory. There's a question about felbamate. Now, felbamate is not a drug that's uh, used a great deal uh, because it uh, can be uh, potentially risky to the bone marrow and to the liver. But if people have been on it for a few months and they haven't had trouble, then generally they're out of the woods on that and it's okay. Uh, felbamate is pretty good for memory. It's a stimulatory drug and it usually keeps people sharp. One of the problems with felbamate is that it has a huge number of drug interactions. So if you're on felbamate plus other drugs, it can throw uh, the levels of the other drugs out of whack, and that may make memory problems. So besides drugs, um, Beverly here has a question about are there particular types of seizures that are more likely to cause memory issues than yeah. others? Yes. The, the two types of seizures that are most likely to cause memory problems are your generalized tonic-clonic seizures, which are the commonly known as grand mal seizures, uh, with stiffening, falling down, and shaking. And then the uh, complex partial seizures, which occur in the temporal lobe and involve the hippocampus. Those may start with a feeling of deja vu, or heat, or flushing, or what people call an aura, a warning of a seizure coming on. Then there can be confusion, there can be bubbling, there can be forgetting. Uh, there's not the physical shaking that there is with uh, a tonic-clonic seizure, but the complex partial seizures uh, can cause uh, memory issues. They're the ones that usually most involve the hippocampus. Uh, the best treatment then for that type of seizure is to, con or for memory problems, is to control the seizure itself? Yes. Yes, remember I said there were three factors involved in, in causing uh, memory problems in people with epilepsy. The seizures, the medications, and the underlying uh, brain injury or problem that caused the epilepsy. Two out of three of those are potentially controllable the seizures, and the medications. I have a follow-up question to that. If you're not having clinical seizures, but you have tonic-clonic seizures, are the interictal firings still affecting memory, memory possibly? Yes. And can that be treated? Can that be treated? Yes. Interictal firing um, means uh, between seizure, uh, so there's no obvious seizure going on. But if an EEG were being run to measure the brainwave's activity, there would be electrical discharges called spikes in the EEG. Right. Now, an individual EEG um, spike is typically less than about a tenth or a twentieth of a second. And in itself, it's so brief that it doesn't, doesn't uh, really do anything measurable against memory except in the most strict experimental uh, conditions, not real life. However, if you have runs of those spikes um, amounting to what we call subclinical seizures that don't physically show up, that don't stop you in your tracks, uh, but are affecting the function of the of the hippocampus and the rest of the brain, then it can it can um, adversely influence your your memory from those discharges. And then it may be the case that 
increasing medications may cut back on those discharges and may help the memory. So here we doctors have a bit of a therapeutic dilemma. Someone's got a bad memory. Could it be because seizures are going on in the brain and increasing the medicines are going to help? Or is the problem the medicine, in which case increasing the medicine will make it worse? We don't always know the answer to that, and we sometimes need to do a little trial and error to see which way to go. But I will tell you that probably nine times out of ten, it's the problem with the medicine rather than subclinical, subtle seizures causing the memory problems. So my first response when someone comes in with memory difficulties is to see if there's a medication that can be lowered. Okay. Well, let's take a... Uh, Go ahead, we'll take a few more questions. Three to eight seconds is a long run for that type of firing. Would it not be? Yes, it would. Three to three to eight seconds of, of continued abnormal epileptic activity in the EEG would be uh, not a dangerous amount of seizure activity, but it would be enough that I would think it would affect the memory and it would cause a person to be a little bit inattentive and out of it during the time of that discharge. And it can also affect mood, mood. Pardon me? It can also affect mood at the same time. Um, that is a very interesting question. I, I can't really say yes to that. Um, wh what I can say is that um, people with uncontrolled seizures are many times more likely to experience depression and mood swings than baseline. Um, but uh, I'm not confident that, it, let's say, a five-second long subclinical seizure is going to immediately uh, cause a period of depression right after that discharge. Um, it seems like it, most of the time it has to be a more chronic issue. Um, it's not like the mood fluctuates with every seizure discharge. Robin, there was another question. Olivia would like to know if memory issues are more frequent in teenagers due to the hormone changes that they um, are going undergoing. In, in, uh, in other words, can memory improve as you get older? Usually memory gets worse when you get older. I think many of us uh, experience that. Now, um, I'm used to hearing about how hormonal changes in the teenage years make seizures worse because particularly in women some seizures are hormonally sensitive. Um, is memory worse during some times of the menstrual cycle? Yes, I, I understand it is, although I'm a male so I've not experienced it. Um, but usually I, I think of teenagers' memories as being pretty good. The problem comes when someone's had lifelong epilepsy and the epilepsy has accumulated a bit of memory problems and then, you know, you get to be 70 years old when your memory is starting to be not so good normally and the two of them add, add together. It's more at the end of life rather than the beginning. Other questions? Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, but with the medications, Medications. Um, did you say, yeah, um, what was the name of the pill that you said that's like Tegretol? I'm on uh, there Tegretol are, at the top. There are two, two pills. There are two pills that are like Tegretol. One is uh, Trileptal is the brand name, and Oxcarbazepine is the okay. generic. And then the newest one that's just been out for a couple of years is Aptium, A-P-T-I-O-M. And the generic name of that is a difficult generic, S-Lacarbazepine, S-Lacarbazepine. Those are all in the Tegretol family. And, of course, there are long-acting forms of Tegretol, too, called Carbitrol and Tegretol XR. I'm on Tegretol XR, and I have Tegretol XR. Yeah, Tegretol's been one of my major pills. Yeah, Tegretol is usually not too bad for memory, and it's, it's usually not too bad for mood. You know, I've said that depression can make memory worse, and some of the seizure medicines are also more likely to exacerbate depression. Those are phenobarbital, 
Keppra, and sometimes the benzodiazepines. And uh, lamotrigine, which is lamictal, is, uh, is known for often being good for the mood. So if memory problems are the result of depression making the memory worse, then a medicine like Keppra may make it even worse, and a medicine like Lamictal might make it better. Again, these are general statements for the average person. Whether they would be true for an individual would have to be worked out with your own I, medical team. I've, I've tried Keppra. That affected me. My mood terribly. You know, I was told I was on for eight, 18 months to 12 years old, and that made me mentally ill. Yes, well, I'm on Lamictal, Tegretol, um, also on, on, on Vintac, and, um, yeah, Lamictal, Tegretol, Vintac, and Lyrica, all the pills that I'm on. Yes. Are those bad for the memory? Well, um, that's a combination therapy, and when people are on multiple drugs, it's even it's even potentially a little bit uh, tougher on the memory. Uh, so um, I'm not going to tell you to make any changes, but uh, perhaps your regimen could be reviewed by your by your doctors. So, Robin, we have time for one more question. Uh, if you have one there, you you pick it, and then we'll we'll be at um, we'll be at an hour at that point. You know, I think we covered most of the issues in one respect or another. Um, but people are wondering how they could get access to the previous talk that you gave on the um, psychological and psychiatric um, effects of epilepsy. Okay. So um, what I will do is um, I will take the uh, at least the talk part, not necessarily the question and answer part, um, and um, find a way to post post those talks through the uh, site uh, of the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California, which is our, our home base epilepsy organization that's helping us organize these programs. Um, the reason I won't post all the questions uh, and answers and comments is we didn't have all of the suitable privacy and legal disclaimers in place um, until, until the this talk, so I'm not uh, I'm not able to post your comments, but I can post my slides and my comments because I don't care about the privacy part. Um, so we'll make that available through the Epilepsy Foundation. It may take us a few weeks to do that, and then um, keep tuned uh, because so long as there's an interest and an audience, uh, we'll do these uh, these shows on the uh, second Saturday of every month, 11 o'clock Pacific time, 2 o'clock um, Atlantic time. Uh, the next uh, show is going to be by a, uh, a UCSF uh, neurologist, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Susanna uh, Cornis, who's uh, an expert on uh, stress and epilepsy. So that's a topic of uh, great interest because uh, many, many of my patients tell me that they think their seizures are much worse around times of stress. So how does that happen? Why does it happen? And what are they going to be able to, what are you going to be able to do about that? Um, so that will be uh, next next month's uh, topic. Uh, but now that you all know the way to the uh, program, uh, don't be strangers. Uh, feel free to, uh, to join in. Um, we'll uh, have to post a different link in or phone call in number uh, for each program because that's the way the uh, computer software works. And that brings us to the end of the program on thinking and memory. Uh, thank you all very much for participating.